I'm thinking at the moment. And that's very elegant because even Aristotle uh, put thought, uh, thought contemplating thought was what Aristotle said, the, the unmoved mover of the universe, what other people call God was thought contemplating thought. And that's a very elegant way of looking at it. And that's why so many people like Aristotle, even though I'm sure it may not be true. But it was an aesthetically pleasing. Aesthetics means study of beauty. Aesthetically pleasing way to put things. And Descartes put it in an aesthetically ple pleasing way. Thinking is a very high thing, we think, an elegant thing. Uh, you could say, um, can I be crude? Can I? Yeah, you don't mind? I fart, therefore I, I exist. That wouldn't be as pleasing, would it? I'm sorry to be crude, but there you go. Uh, you know, it would work just as well, though, wouldn't it? Why? Because as long as you up imply the I, you imply the exist. As long as you can say something about the I, then the exist follows. You've already assumed what you want to prove. Because the fact that you, you, I, are doing something means that you do exist. That's what we mean by exist. So I could say that was a crude one. I apologize for that one. But you could say, I sneeze, therefore I exist. I snore, therefore I exist. I laugh, therefore I exist. I go to sleep, therefore I exist. Uh, I drive a car, therefore I exist. You could say anything, and it would work. Any statement would work like that with the one. But he chose the most elegant one he could think of. I think, therefore. And that is pretty elegant, and it's worth remembering as the first principle. He tried to build a cohesive system on top of that. Whether he did or not, I don't know. But he did help build the uh, calculus, so he's not a stupid person. And the calculus does work. Calculus does put spaceships in orbit, television sets uh, in circulation, cell phones moving, and every other thing that are the familiar parts of our modern universe. And the people who don't, who are beheading everybody and doing all these other crazy things, they don't want the modern universe, you see. Yet they take advantage of the modern universe. They like to fly everywhere and prepare terrorist acts. They like to take advantage of the, of the accoutrements of the modern universe. They like to use cell phones. They like to use television sets. Uh, I'm sure Bin Laden watched James Bond when he was young and got half his ideas from James Bond movies, particularly Dr. No. And I'm sure that when he was young, he was watched things like that because he was spoiled a kid in Saudi Arabia. And I'm sure he had, you know, uh, videotapes of that kind. And I'm sure uh, he watched it all day long, that stuff. And uh, when he grew up, he became uh, what we are seeing today. You know, he is basically Dr. No. Just the fact, the only problem is there's no James Bond <laughs> to go get it. But in any case, uh, um, if you use that idea of something, give me a footnote, man. <laughs> you heard it. Um, but these guys like to use modern things, but they want to go back to the medical world. Okay, so after they use all the modern things and they destroy the, the, the modern world that we live in, then they're going to just reinstitute their medical world of forcing people to believe things and living in a, a non-modern universe. So they won't have all the modern inventions and everything else that we have. Uh, they'll just go back in time to the uh, medical caliphate or, or, or whatever it was. Total insanity from our point of view, from their, their point of view and their, uh, their, uh, their uh, supporters, it makes sense, but from our point of view, it's total insanity. But in any event, uh, they, they are against the modern world. So we think the modern world is good, they think the modern world is bad, they want to go back to the medieval world, and all these other accoutrements are part of the medieval world. So let's go to the Old Testament then. So in, what's this got to do with the Old Testament? Well, in evaluating the Old Testament, you have to be willing to hear things in a university, since the university is the temple of these things I just said, the temple of the Descartes, the Cartesian universe, the temple of the Einsteinian universe, the temple of the Aristotelian universe, the secular scientific world. We have to be able to meet the standards that they are supposedly meeting in biology, physics, chemistry, uh, computer science, and everything else. We can't go around saying things in the religious studies area that, that they'll laugh at in the physics department. You know, we have to meet the same criterion they do. So we have to evaluate things on the same level that they do. And if we see there's something wrong with a text, we have to be able to say that. And if that hurts people's beliefs or feelings, 
then you know they shouldn't take a class in a subject that their sensibilities or feelings are liable to get hurt in or bruised by. In other words, they have to be able to look at the material in a free way just like anyone else would. And they can't come in and say, I can't consider that thing because if you're that way, you shouldn't take a class like that. You should go take Shakespeare. You're not worshiping Shakespeare, so you don't mind someone saying something positive or negative about Shakespeare. You're not worshiping um, uh, the comic spirit in the literature department, so go take the comic spirit. But if the religious thing that people are talking about in the class is so precious to you that you can't hear a different view, then you shouldn't subject yourself to that or be in an environment of that kind because the academic study of religion may be hurtful in some ways to beliefs or things that you've heard. If some Muslims come into class about Islam, I expect to hear what they've heard in their madrasas. Well, we're not going to teach what they heard in the madrasah. We're going to teach what modern uh, Western academic scholars say. People say, well, why don't you teach what Eastern scholars say? Well, because this is a Western university, that's why. I mean, what? We have nothing precious in the West anymore? Everything is uh, relative? What someone says in, uh, in uh, um, Pakistan madrasa is equivalent to what uh, a great scholar at Oxford says? I don't think so. I don't think so. Not in the West. It may be in the East. So if you want the great scholar of the madrasa, go to Pakistan. But if you're going to come to America, then you've got to accept the standards on which the American university is constructed. So in that sense, the Old Testament is a difficult subject because um, people who have the idea that it's the Word of God get upset if you show anything in the book that may not be the Word of God or may not look like the Word of God but may look like the Word of human beings. And it's, a, it, 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 it's now, and yet the people who believe in the Word of God idea are the ones who are interested in the Old Testament. So they're the ones who want to go and take the Old Testament class, and I compliment them for that. But on the other hand, they don't really want to hear what academics say about the Old Testament. So they want a course that they would get in their church here in the university. And it just isn't the kind of course that universities get. So what we're going to do is a high-level, hopefully sophisticated approach to the Old Testament. And hopefully it will make you respect the Old Testament. I care about the Old Testament. I think it's a beautiful document. But I don't want to read more into the Old Testament than it can bear. I don't think it's absolutely perfect. I think it does show uh, the signs of its human contributors. And um, it's not infallible in every way, shape, or form. It's just an extremely impressive cultural document.